Today is October 18th, 2006, and I'm uh, at the home of Mr. Elmer Harris, uh, who's been a longtime uh, citizen and resident of the city of Piqua. And uh, the occasion for which I am present at his home resulted from a contact with uh, Miss Phyllis Jackson of Yellow Springs, who at a AAGGMB, that's the African American Genealogy Group of the Miami Valley meeting, uh, handed me a picture and asked me to deliver this picture to Mr. Harris. And uh, from there we decided to uh, engage in a little conversation that might be worthwhile noting and recording for uh, historical purposes uh, in connection with uh, uh, particularly blacks uh, in Piqua. Now Elmer, uh, the picture that uh, she gave uh, to you or sent, me, sent to you by way of me uh, had a, a picture of several black children playing in what was described as a nursery school and uh, apparently your mother was involved in connection with that nursery school. That's correct. Okay. You want to tell us about uh, what you remember of uh, that situation, if anything? Well, I remember it all right because where they had their nursery school, when I went to Yellow Springs, I was in the first grade. And that's where I started school. And they was building a new high school. And when they completed a new high school, they moved the elementary grades into the old building, which was down right down the alley, and, and that's. Now I don't remember whether, frankly, whether her mother had a nursery school someplace else before that or not, but I do remember it there, and I do remember some of the students that were there. Uh, what was the lady's name? What was her maiden name? Then? Lawson. Uh, Lawson is oh, correct. Yes. Phyllis Lawson. Oh yeah, I do all the Lawsons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there father was was uh, employed by um, Antioch College. Okay. And the Antioch College was just as liberal then as it is today. It was very, very liberal. Um, if you notice that dollar seventy six cents a day for <laughs> for a child a week, wasn't it? Yeah. It was a, in that article it, the, the the parent or whoever sponsored the child paid a dollar seventy six cents a week and they have to have to, out of that five days a week they got Orange juice and lunch. <laughs> <laughs> now you said that uh, uh, Yellow Springs or Antioch College was uh, a pretty liberal uh, community even back in the uh, 1920s oh, uh, when that picture was taken. But I noticed that uh, the picture uh, was labeled colored nursery school. So even then there You're was colored. a... <laughs> Even then, uh, there was a segregated, uh, you know, uh, system apparently in terms of, uh, you know, schooling and or not the nursing. Not in the school, just the nursing care. Is that mm -hmm. right? This, this, this. A lot of the children's parents work for Antioch College employees, professors, and teachers. And they had to leave the children home because they had no place to leave them. So it's my understanding that actually Antioch was responsible for initiating this nursery school. Uh, whether that's correct or not, I don't know, but that was my understanding. But uh, yeah, I remember one girl, what was her name? Echo Bell or something. I couldn't stand it. I was just six years old, but I always got <laughs> teed up alongside of her. <laughs> Well, the uh, picture uh, led to a discussion of uh, not only your mother's involvement with the uh, nursery school, but also your father's uh, uh, occupation and uh, reason uh, for being in uh, Yellow Springs at that time. Uh, and it also led to a discussion about uh, uh, his background. Uh, I promised that I would make an effort to do a little uh, genealogy uh, uh, research and uh, I have uh, with me a couple of things that you might be interested in. I might not even know about that. You might need to turn on the light there, but uh, uh, that's the 1930 census 
and uh, and you were yeah you were living in uh, Yellow Springs at that time and uh, you can see uh, all of your family members uh, are listed at that time uh, there's a complete page of the census which is really small print and then you can find uh, a blow up just of the your family group uh, okay. uh, so that you can the see that page, a little yeah. bit better at that time why don't you uh, if you can make out uh, uh, everybody in the family and their ages why don't you tell me uh, in 1930 uh, read to us uh, uh, the ages of uh, your parents as well, well as your in, siblings. In 1930 I was eight years old and my sister, oldest sister, was still living and at 91. She was the oldest. There was five of us children to start with. I re remember my one brother. He passed away before, when I was quite young. But Madge was the oldest. Virginia was next to the oldest. And then Buddy who passed away and then my brother Bill who was lost in World War II and myself. But I'm sure that that 1927 is correct, but when I left here, I even remember my teacher's name in the first grade of Wilder, her name was Mrs. Elliot, and uh, uh, 1927 is the year Wilder opened, hmm. Wilder School, and I started there in kindergarten, but no, that's a, you know, maybe a year or so it doesn't make any difference whether it is, right? But I do remember I was six years old when we moved to Yellow Springs. Okay, so... You were in Yellow Springs in 1927, 1930, but you were actually born in Piqua. Oh, yeah. You were a Piqua native. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. What was it that your uh, uh, father did uh, while uh, being here in Piqua? Well, when my mother met him, he was a barber. And, uh, and then, of course, looking back, you know, the barber trade was changing when he used to have their own cup and he'd go to the barber shop and then he'd get shaved every morning and then of course things changed. Anyway, he, he worked at a drugstore. He was working at a drugstore when he got his first permanent assignment as a Methodist minister and that's when we moved in uh, to Yellow Springs and it was very, very brave on his part. That was during the Depression. And he had a steady job and, and he gave it up to go into the, you know, to follow his calling and move to Yellow Springs. Uh, and we was there until about 1930. I know I was in third grade when we left there. And uh, and he had college at the time, and they found out that he wasn't going to be reassigned. They were going to find a position for him at their college, but he preferred to come back to Pickle. All of our children, all of us were born in Pickle. All of us. Okay. Where was your father himself born at? He was born in Longtown, Ohio, which is very close to the Indiana border, which is just, what, what is that, northwest of Greenville? Yeah. Okay. As I understand it, that was um, a community that had uh, uh, been receptive to slaves and or freed people. It was who, established by an ex-slave. A man by the name of James Clemens in the year 1820. And, uh, and then of course, you know, the families grew and for a long time there was very, they were very close knit. And uh, there was about only four members, names there that I can remember, and they were kind of intermarried and stayed amongst themselves. And uh, there was the Clemenses and the Basses and the uh, Jennings and the Epses, and that's all I remember. Not many others. Okay. I think there's still a, a, a black farmer over there from that clan. But I, I was told by my dad, whether it was true or not, that the settlement was originally established, maybe with the help of James Clemens, who I just mentioned. I don't know this to be a fact, but it was established for slave owners in the South to send their mistresses when they became expecting to get them away from their homes in the South. And that's how it originally was supposed to have started. Now, whether that's true, to, I don't know. I don't know what's about poverty. Okay. Well, we do know this. I, I think that you mentioned uh, to me the fact that uh, your mother 
uh, uh, attended and graduated from Wilberforce University. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. She she she, she graduated from Wilberforce. Such a statement. Well, Wilberforce there was such a statement. She went there, but it was Wilberforce Church School in 1910, and then she taught school in um, in Wheeling, West Virginia, until she met and married my dad. Well, since you mentioned uh, the fact that uh, many slave holders uh, sent their mistresses north, I, I am aware of the fact that uh, many slave owners uh, sent their um, uh, children, their illegitimate uh, children, north uh, to be educated at Wilberforce University. That's true. So uh, it's it it's no stretch for that to have been the uh, situation that uh, prompted uh, the founding of yeah. uh, Contrary America. to what a lot of people believe, a lot of the, the slaves of the South were highly respected and regarded by their masters, and they looked out after them, you know. And, uh, not all of them, but there were some good ones, I guess. Uh, but, uh, uh, and they, and just like I told you about my my mother's father, he was, well, you can get into that later if you want to. But no, he who was city. your mother's father? Tell us about your mother's father. If well, you like. he was born a slave in Virginia. And when the Civil War started, he went into the Civil War in uniform, I imagine as an aide to his master. And when the master realized that, that they were going to lose the war, and apparently he felt a lot of him, he gave him a horse and twenty-five dollars and set him free, and he migrated to say Clarenceville, Ohio. Whereas a slave, an ex-slave, he established his own business, as a which today would be a trucking business. And then it was a dray business they called it, and he raised fourteen children there. And and, uh, and then later on he moved to, to Delaware, Ohio. But I remember him. He's my only really authentic grandparent that I remember. Uh, but uh, he sent four of his children to college. Including your mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, what, are, what are your earliest recollections? You told us uh, about actually remembering uh, attending Wilder when it was uh, soon opened. What are your earliest recollections of Piqua in general? Well, it was neither black or white, as I look back. Uh, I learned later on the difference between black and white. <laughs> but uh, Pickle was kind of unique, uh, different than it is today as far as people owning homes are concerned. There wasn't any particular area in Piqua now, excluding uh, Rossville, that the blacks moved. They, they had some very nice homes here in Piqua. There was a jury family on Broadway and the Medleys on Broadway and, and uh, the Carters on Park Avenue and they had very nice homes. They worked the main the main employment for Piccolo was domestic barbers and there's foundries here and the blacks worked in the foundries. And uh, of course at that time barbers were in great demand because you know Four electric razors, <laughs> but uh, I have to look back to really realize the prejudice part of Piccolo, because I didn't know the difference between black and white when I was a kid. Because we was we was always raised in a mixed neighborhood, and uh, I didn't find out until later possibly the later years of junior high school or high school, that there was a difference. Uh, and of course there still is. But uh, I know my dad came back here from Yellow Springs without a job with four children. And there was, he was offered, that's when, when jobs were all about, you couldn't buy a job. He was offered a job by four different concerns here in Pickle because of his reputation, which people benefit today by maintaining a good reputation. Mm -hmm. And he went to work at the uh, Oil Place Building, which he worked there for 31 years as a uh, as a custodian. 
mother worked at the, in domestic work as a cook after her children were old. Now she had attended college and uh, had teaching experience before yeah. she married. Why wouldn't she have, uh, you know, pursued uh, education as a career path in the Pickwa City Schools? You know, you know the answer to that without asking me. It was just the fact that it was Pickwa. And uh, Pickwa was and still is an area that's very prejudiced. They, they, uh, they let you go so far and then they hold you back. But then, even then, you couldn't teach. A female could not teach if she was married. I don't think that had anything to do with my mother's condition. She wasn't even considered. I remember that one time when a, a so-called associate of mine was, and I was working in human relations uh, drive here, trying to get things kind of settled back in the 60s. But well, we was at a, a community meeting down at the Green Street Church, and, and uh, my parents' name came up, and this one person says, well, I don't know what Elmer has to complain about. He says his his father had a good job at at the uh, as a custodian, a janitor, and his mother worked for uh, the J. Ben Wilson family. She had a good job, and this person who was with me was also a Caucasian, and he said, "Well, yeah, but she was qualified to do other than cook, and uh, she was she was qual qualified to t to." Uh, to teach, but she never had an opportunity here in Pickwell. <laughs> it's still like that in Pickwell. <laughs> With the exception of the Hamiltons. <laughs> well, we'd like to think that, uh, you know, uh, we're a much more progressive community in uh, 2000 than where we were in 1930. Uh, well, we are, but I can take a lot of credit for that selfishly of my own. Uh, 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 we organized a, a human relations committee here when things were really t tense racially. And what do you mean by that? You know, you say when things were uh, tense. Well, racially. I meant when the riots were going on in different cities, and and uh, the people hadn't really stood up for themselves until the sixties. I mean, they was more or less held back and just performed the way you're supposed to until they found out that there something could be done about improving their way of life. And uh, um, he just accepted it. I accepted it when I was a kid, the fact that, that there were certain things that I couldn't do and couldn't say, but I, I didn't know why until I got older, still in school. And then I resented it, you know what I mean, uh, which showed up in various ways. But uh, I don't know. That was kind of a unique place. It's, it's improved. No question about that. So you were uh, about to say how you um, could say that you had some credit or took some satisfaction in... Uh, things changed. Oh, yeah, yeah. How so? Well, what really started it with me was the fact that when I was a youngster, we weren't permitted to go to the YMCA until a, a fellow here in town named, we called him Pat Mitchell, Bill Mitchell, kind of took an interest in the, in the black youth of Pickle, and then he made arrangements with the um, I guess it was a director, whatever position it was at YMCA, A.J. Kaiser, for us to go to the YMCA on Wednesday night. Prior to that, we were admitted to go to Camp Wakanda as the last group of the year. <laughs> and that kind of wormed their way into YMCA with Pat Mitchell's influence and his pressure. And we went on Wednesday night, but we weren't permitted to swim in the pool. Because the money, a man, and I know this to be a fact, the man that donated the money for the pool, not the present pool, but the, but the old pool, he would only donate the money with the stipulation that no blacks would ever swim in the pool. I, I don't know whether it was colored in or Negroes or whatever we were, but we weren't black then. I mean, we weren't classified as blacks then. So when my son was, our son, 
was four years old or five years old, I lived close to a pretty good body of water and I was interested in him learning how to swim because I knew how, how boys will do. So I was working out of town at the time on the project and my wife took him down to the, he was five years old, took him down to the Y for a swim uh, instruction, learn how to swim. And along with Doug Smith, he and, he, he and Doug went down, and they was admitted at five. At that time, you had to be in the sixth grade before you was eligible to join the YMCA. And so the next year, I was in town, and much to our surprise, they, they accepted them then, Doug Smith and, and William. And the next year, I happened to be having the job I was working on was close to town, so I took him down to sign him up. And... It was double the amount of what it was the previous year. What I thought was just a discouragement, so I went and paid it anyhow. And in a short time, why he got a car where he was admitted to the YMCA. And that was only because we had a, they had a new director come in here from, oh, I can't think of your name now. And he didn't, he was always ridiculous that blacks couldn't even join the Y. He said if he had known the condition was like that, he would have never accepted the assignment here. And this man was very influential in getting the blacks to join the Y. So we started off, actually, actually, William and Doug were not the first two members. Imogene Andy, or Imogene Friel's son, was the first. But of course in Pickway, the blacks, the whites thought they knew all the blacks, and the Friel's name wasn't familiar to them when his schoolmates bought his name in for membership and they accepted it. And then when they found out that he was black, they wouldn't let him participate. But they wanted to give the money back, but I'm mean, wouldn't take the money back. So he was never actually active. And, but Doug and William was the first two active members of the YMCA. And from then on, why, why, um, uh, it's, it, it developed into what it is today. Now, you've, uh, there was the gentleman who, at uh, the Green Street uh, Church, uh, who was indicating that uh, uh, your parents uh, lived pretty comfortably, and I'm sure that there are people today who would say, you know, the same thing in terms of uh, having you reflect back upon your own uh, personal livelihood. Tell us what uh, you did for a living. What? Tell us what you did for a living. Oh, uh, uh Getting back to living very comfortably, there's a whole lot of more blacks and people living more comfortably than we did, uh, uh, because they had we weren't poor. And the next thing to it, <laughs> we didn't have all the modern conveniences that some of the other blacks did in Pickwell. Well. But uh, what I did, uh, the first full-time job I had in Pickwell, well, I worked for Dr. Wilkins. When I was in school, and I made a total of two dollars and fifty cents a week <laughs> for every day after school up to seven eight o'clock at night, and uh, Saturday to the half day on Sunday. From there, I went in to work for. Before I graduated, I went to work at the Val Decker Packing Company because that was the only place that she could get a job. And the only reason why I got a job. There, this is during the Depression, during the rough times, was the fact that Doug Smith's father worked for Bill Decker. And the only way you get a job is know somebody like Bill Decker that, that, that uh, would, could get you a job. So I worked there until I went into the Navy in 1942. And then I come out of the Navy and I started to the, uh, the Union had a, uh, had a class that they were starting apprentice class here in Pickle because the war had depleted practically all the brick masons around here and they was trying to establish and get more people for the coming boom that was supposed to be coming. There was 33 of us that entered this class and uh, we Were they all blacks? No, no, colored? no. There was uh, Johnny Muscoe, Merchant Page, Homer Sawyer, and a guy named Danny Williams, Petroy, and myself were the only black members. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, 
there were three, three of us that started, and we had more or less introductory work in the basement of Spring Street School until the weather improved. Then we went to underneath the stadium to learn the fundamentals of using your tools and whatnot. Then it was down to 21 people because it got kind of lean in the wintertime with nobody working. And the time came for us to go to work in the workplace, and, and, and I thought it was a fair method. They put the ones to work that had the most dependents. I only had one, we only had one child at the time, so I was low on the totem pole. We were all veterans. Yeah, all those were veterans. So uh, I just bugged a contractor in town every morning until he got to try to look at me until he finally gave me a job. And who <laughs> I was applied that? with Hunter and, and, and Raglan. But they'd already put on Merch and, and Charlie Busco and uh, Holman Sawyer was working for Homer when this school started, but he was considered enough to be in our class. But, he, you know, it's, it's expensive to start out uh, with an apprentice for about the first year to 18 months so he could at least earn his own money. So Homer lived right there on North Street, right down there, right just down up where I used to live. And, he, and I known him since I was a kid. And he apologized because he couldn't give me a job. But I went to work for a white contractor named Van Winans and worked for him for about two years and then I ended up coming back to work for Hutter and Ragged. Finished my trade with Hutter and Ragged. And eventually I partnered with Homer and then eventually I bought Homer out. And then of course my son and I merged when, we, when I incorporated and we went, from, went on from there. That's about the only good thing. I was a diesel mechanic in the Navy, but when I got out of the Navy, there wasn't any diesel around here. Believe it or not, some of you listen to this program, the, the trains were all steam. <laughs> they had diesel engines out on the West Coast, but they didn't have any here. So I got in the next best thing. I was getting ready to go to auto mechanic school. I put in for auto mechanic school. And because my brother and I, before we went into the service, we, divided, we both volunteered and said, if we're going to have to go into this, we'll go into a branch of the service that we would like and, and could be beneficial to us after we got out of the service. And so Charlie Musco taught me into starting this brick in school. You're supposed to get $90 a month from the government for any school program. But I think it was about two years before I got a penny. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I, I didn't know anything about brick work. So that was that attributed uh, attributable to the uh, GI Bill. That was how you. Yes, yeah, it was under the GI Bill. Okay, tell me a little bit about your war experience. I mean, what what was uh, what was it like uh, serving Uncle Sam uh, during World War II? Well, I was in the Navy, and not being facetious, but I was fortunate. I I qualified after well, we, all the white recruits in Great Lakes training when we went to school. It was a segregated camp, Camp Robert Smalls at Great Lakes, which all the service was segregated in. Everything was segregated in. And uh, the rest of the, uh, uh, the white boys were getting six weeks and going out into the tree and, and the fleet, rather. And we had, we was there for eight, six weeks and then they put up on the board of year eight. We ended up being 16 weeks of basic training because they didn't know where to put us. They, they couldn't integrate us, they couldn't mix us. But I qualified for, for a special school down in Hampton, Virginia, and as a diesel engineer, and I, and like I say, not, I, I was fortunate enough because I, I worked at what I wanted to do the whole time I was in the Navy. Uh, a lot of them were nothing, no more than just labor forces. <laughs> so you weren't out on the sea at oh, any yeah. time. You 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 did do. Oh yeah, I was chief engineer on the on the on the last ship I was on. I never was in combat. I was in combat area, but uh, yeah, what that's was, what we were. What was the name of the ship that you were on? Well, I was on the Pocatello, but the last one I was on was the USS Nootka, and it was built in Fort Oregon. And I was there, and when it was completed, I was there when they launched it, and I rode down the ways in it, and I was there with. When we took our first, uh, our first trip, we went down the Willamette River to the Columbia River and then in the Pacific, and we were headed for Alaska. And by being a brand new, we were we were a seagoing tugboat, and 
the 12th Naval District, which was Frisco, or the 13th Naval District, which was Seattle, and the 14th Naval District, which was Anchorage, they all warned us. So we got by halfway up to Anchorage, and they sent us back to Seattle. So I worked out of Seattle, uh, doing all kind of work, salvage work, moved, moved barges up the coast, and uh, until I got discharged. But I was always on Pocatello was a World War I converted frigate. And they weren't mixing the crews. I mean, it's strange, Larry, because submarine crew, and there's a fellow here in Pickway worked on a submarine. And of course, submarines were very, the person that was very closely related, they had to be, in the conditions they lived under. And they did everything that you're supposed to do. And I mean, they had all, they were, they were not part of the crew until they got in that certain combat area. But they were officers' servants. They cooked for them and, and stewards, officer stewards, they called them. But on the submarine, you have multiple duties and they were considered part of the crew. On combat, combative vessels, uh, they wouldn't put us on uh, because they wouldn't mix the crew. On non combative vessels, which we called the Duggaree Navy, which was the <laughs> overall Navy, uh, we ended up, when I go back to the Pocatello, I went out, went out to Mary Island and I was on a, and I was on a small patrol boat right in the waters of around San Francisco. And they took seven of us in different parts of the area and put us aboard this Pocatello to see if we could work together, you know. And we was never officially assigned to it because the Secretary of the Navy was Knox and he was finally against merging the crews together. So they put us, and we, we, we patrolled up down the coast. We would take convoys up to the tip of Alaska, then to the shores, and pick them up and take them on into Japan and Okinawa and whatnot. But it was a raggedy thing. I mean, <laughs> they put out, I think, the worst ship in the day. But they put us under this heat to see if we could get along. And it was kind of, it was kind of crisp at first. I know the first time that we went through a minefield up through the Straits of Juan the Fu off of uh, the Canadian coast, the crews were there in a part like that. But after we went through that, they were like that. <laughs> and they burned, because we all was subjected to the same danger. And then I left there and well, when brother got killed in, in Italy, I was kind of difficult to get along with. Him. So they how transferred was, me. How was your How was your brother? You know, where, where did you guys both go into the service at the same time? Or no, he went in two months before me. Two months before you. Yeah. And uh, which branch of the service did he enter? Well, oh, he was in Tuskegee Airmen. He was a. Uh, he was the. Uh, and I didn't find this out until they had that. 100th anniversary down in Dayton, there was four, four fighter squadrons and he, he couldn't qualify as a pilot that's because he didn't, he didn't have two years college when he went in. But uh, he was in charge of the maintenance and operation of all four fighter squadrons and he went, ended up in Italy in um, Ramatil, no, yeah, Ramatil, Italy, that's where he was killed. The brain, he was very intelligent. He went from uh, book private to master sergeant in four months. <laughs> he was an honor student, honor, honor student in high school. He graduated with all kinds of honors. Oh yeah, he was. What was what was the circumstances uh, surrounding his death? Are, were you I never really got told? Full detail. It was it was it was during an operation, a raid on the on the airfield there at the, uh, where the airport was in Ramatilla, Italy. That's why I went to that, uh, you know, when they had anniversary down in Dayton of the 100th year, the Air Force, whatever it was. I thought that there would be somebody there that could give me. The sad part about it, the sad part about it is, and I know it happens, the way my parents found out that my brother was killed, Myrna Bolden walked up the street and said she got a letter from somebody in, 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 in the service that was close to where he was killed. And that's how my parents found out, that she told them. So then they inquired with the Red Cross and found out that it was authentic. You know. 
No letter from the government, no not, visit not from U.S. Uh, military, not no personnel. Mm -hmm. That's sad. He was killed. He was killed on the field. And apparently one of the planes was shot down, the way I understand it, crashed into the vehicle where he was going out to service another plane. And he was killed by that plane. That was in uh, June the 2nd, 1944. So it was one of our planes that had been shot and was landing, or? I, mean, I guess a pretty hot time was going on there. Had an air battle over the field. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I could never really find anybody to give me. I heard, you know, it's a strange thing, Larry, when something like that happened, everybody wants to claim me as a witness. And everybody I ask gives me a different story. <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't know. See, he was married to sisters sister. That's Rita's mother. Her name was Harriet Bolton. And then she died of childbirth and my parents raised Rita. And then he married a, a particular girl by the name of Gladys Ward right before he went overseas in December of 1943. But you know what? There's nobody around anymore to verify this. I can tell you anything. Because <laughs> they're, they're still gone. They are. Of all the employees I had here in Pickle, and most of them are black, they're all gone. Every last one of them are deceased. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesse was, remember Jesse Olden? Mm -hmm. Quite an athlete. He was the last one. I can remember. Did Hal Reeves work for you? Oh, yeah. you? I fought Hal about six <laughs> times. <laughs> we were raised again. That's the reason why I worked for him six times. <laughs> he was, oh my goodness, and he got a son that like him, Tim, just exactly like him. Hal was very intelligent. Yes, he was. He was. he was one of the first people that I met when I came to town, and he yeah. was very, very helpful, he very could, supportive. He couldn't put things together. He couldn't, couldn't, he couldn't control it. He couldn't control his own intelligence, you know. I remember, I think about it quite often. He told me, he said, that, that the, and he was, he was mean when he was young. Matter of fact, uh, it's all this one being recorded. Okay. <laughs> Matter of fact, he and a fellow by the name of Sam Ward was over on the river, which was one of our main hangouts. And his white boys came down the rowboat and called him an N name. So they rocked him all the way to El Neem. <laughs> and the police arrested him. And he, the only way he got out of it, I got out of it, was he went out to California and lived about two years with his mother's, with his mother's sister. But how was me? He was me. He, uh, he changed. <laughs> okay, well, tell me uh, uh, a little bit about uh, your uh, your family and uh, uh, your wife and uh, children. Well, my wife came to Pickle, Willie Mae Kelly, the same day or week that I graduated from high school. And she was raised in an orphanage in, in below Louisville, Kentucky. And the operator, owner of this orphanage, his name was Reverend Singleton, he, on his own, not through state aid or local aid or federal aid, he established this orphanage in Louisville on Chestnut Street for during the war, I mean, I'm sorry, during the depression when the parents couldn't take care of the kids, they dumped me to care of them. And he started out with a few and he had got so many that he ended up uh, moving a ball farm down in below uh, Louisville. He had over a hundred kids down there. And the way he got his money to operate this place, he went around and Indiana, Kentucky, to Ohio and solicited money and clothes and perishables and food and everything to, so this, this orphanage could survive. And consequently, when the kid became of age, well, of course, he had to place them. And my wife, when she graduated from high school, why, why uh, he placed her as a nanny for the 
Gordon Sims' family because Gordon Sims' family was a contributor to his orphanage. And she came here and she lived there on 35 Orchard Road with them, help raise her two children, Polly and Blair, until we was married in uh, February 1945. And we was married in Los Angeles and the ship I was to go on was being built in Port Oregon, and we end up in Port Oregon, and, <laughs> and twice before the ship was launched. And then she came back here expecting our first child, and we've been here ever since. Uh, there's a few girls here from Pickle that, that were raised in the same orphanage. Dave uh, Jones's mother was Margie. She was raised, she was younger than I. She was raised in the orphanage. Uh, Dave Williams and, uh, and Sue Williams, their mother was raised in the same orphanage. Matter of fact, a lot of they came here together. Why wouldn't me? And they found some place for her. So she came here and worked with her. They weren't blood sisters, they were home sisters. You know? And she came here and she wouldn't leave until they found a place for a lot of them. And she came here and worked with her. Worked with the French, and they were the French family. Up there. And, and we have two children. One, Randy's our, our oldest child, our daughter. And she has two children and five grandchildren. <laughs> and our son, William, he and I was in business together until I, I retired. And now his son is in business with him. And we did a lot of work. We did. In Piqua, getting back to the conditions in Piqua, if Homer and I started getting too progressive, they cut us off. You know, they did. They, so I said, How I do you mean that? What do you mean? I mean, we, we couldn't get work. If, in other words, we did all the work in the air of that and my ministries until they changed their structural. But then, whether it was the fact that we were union or the fact that we were black, when we started getting improving, then the, the bids that that uh, we were getting before, we wouldn't get. Uh, so I said, well, the best thing for me to do after home and I was dissolve partnership was get out of Pickle. So it kind of opened up in Dayton when they are when they remodeled the arcade down there, and I went down there in 1978, and, and we did our first job in Dayton. And from then on, we did work everywhere: <laughs> uh, Delaware, Columbus, Plain City, Eaton, Cincinnati. Uh, what are some of the buildings that uh, you know the average person might? Uh, be able to, you know, recognize or know about. In Piqua? In Piqua or where? Well, let me show you my pride. You, uh, I get, stay there. I'll, get, I'll show you my pride and joy. Like, I, I named the industry, but we did the uh, third savings and loan and remodeled, put that new facade on it. We did the border city, both downtown, or they're not border city now, but they were then. Downtown and up on Sunset. We put additions on the field house of Wilder School and so many, I took me half and got a half a half of a bar. Put an addition on Green Street Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Social Security Building, which is now the church purchase back there. The YMCA, the YWCA, all small contractors start out in, in the house, at residential most of us. Then you go up from there. And at one time after the war, there just was not that many brick masons around. So Hunter and Ragnar got practically all the good work because because they were the qualified uh, mason contracts in the area. Now see, it's kind of interesting, Larry, because way back then, before I even remember, there was a, a contractor here from Urbana, Ohio, who was a black. Uh, even though he didn't look at it, he was a black race. John Anderson. 
And John Anderson did uh, uh, Orfelt and Big Jobs. And then uh, Homer Collins succeeded John Anderson. He's black. And that's Homer's uncle. He succeeded. And when you went to school, of course, he was, he was in charge of the uh, maintenance over there. Homer Collins, that name familiar to you? Yes, I okay. remember seeing his name on the windows at Cyrene. Right, right. And while he went, he and, um, I can't forget his name now, uh, the president of Central State was just like that. And he ended up, he went, he went broke in Pickler on the Kresge building down there. And so he got a job through politics. He was strong in politics. At the, as a maintenance superintendent for Wilberforce University in Central, for Central State, not Wilberforce, Central State. No, the, the name, the first president of Central State was uh, Charles Wesley. Is that, was that him? That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they lived back down there where the, where now it's dormitories. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sister's, my sister's uh, husband's father was a professor there. Remember when he went back where he used to call the woods? Chihuahua Springs? Well, right there, right, in, right, in, right on the property. Okay. And, and um, Homer Conn lived back there and, and uh, Professor Shields and now it's dormitories. I, I went over there, I was amazed at what they've done over there. But then, now, and then, and then from, all, from Homer Collins, it went to Leonard Ragland, still principally black contractors. And then of course, uh, Musco and Soy was in business for a while, but not too long. And then Homer and I was in business together and we're still carrying on the same, the same theme of black measure contractors. And then of course my son and I, and now he, so it's continuing on. Mm -hmm. well, show us uh, what your pride well, joy is. is this is Miami University, Hamilton branch. And all the work you see there, with the exception of the roofs, was done by our forces. And that's, you, you can't see all of it, it was a large contract. Get it? Mm -hmm. But we worked when I right before I retired, we were doing uh, showcase cinemas, which was a good deal. We did the showcase cinema in Kings Island, and in addition to Hubert Heights, and a large 20 screen at the not Springboro, Springdale. Isn't that north of Cincinnati? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, those are good jobs. When you say it was a good job, that means you made the money on it. <laughs> they were good jobs. And we did the six-story jail in, in Dayton. And ironically, my son and grandson are just finishing the building beside it, which is larger than the jail that I did. It's a juvenile detention facility, right? Exactly beside it. Uh, it's kind of ironic because several jobs that I originally did, my son came along and did additions to them, like in Springfield on um, Clifton. I, I wasn't in business then. I worked there as a bricklayer, and then he just he did a large new school over there, and uh, the wastewater treatment plant here in Pickwell. The original one. He put an addition on that. Well, we put an addition. We did. I was in business together. We worked their work. We worked there. You have to. See, we were union. And when you say union in Pickwell, people get shook up. But there wasn't really that much difference in the wages. They thought there was because we was associated with, with Dayton. But like I told you, we worked in Richmond, Indiana, and Cincinnati, and Springfield. And Columbus, did a Target store in Columbus, and a Mars store in Columbus. We did the Mars store in Springfield. Uh, we did a cool store at at Middletown. Of course, this building here was in Hamilton. Uh, geez, I don't a lot of. 
Uh, Elmer, what was the... Uh, I know that uh, your father, you know, was, was called to uh, pastor in Yellow Springs, but uh, returned to accept uh, uh, a position here in Piqua. At uh, what church was he pastoring here in Piqua? He didn't really have a permanent assignment here in Piqua. He was assistant pastor in Piqua, but he had a permanent assignment at St. James in Troy. He was down there for seven, eight years. Seven, eight years, yeah. And... I, I understand that he had other positions that he. Um, oh yeah, yeah he had. Was he on a circuit? Uh, you know. Yeah, kind of like a circuit judge going around from place to place. That was kind of the circuit preacher. He, 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 uh, he alternated in uh, uh, Romney, which he actually set up the basket meetings in, in Romney, which is close to Anna. Have you ever gone down? Yes. Okay. He started those basket meetings there, and then and then he up where the bulls came from at. Uh, Carthagena, he had church up there, and then of course Longtown. And he'd go one one Sunday, and the next Sunday he'd go one, and then he'd go to the other one. And we rode that, that train back and forth, the Falls of Canal route. That's how we got to those places. But uh, he kind of broke away from the AME church for a while, and then he went to the Baptist church, and then he came back to the AME church, and that's when he was assigned to Troy. Uh, I'm trying to think where else. Well, I guess those are the places where he was. So you remember other uh, pastors and uh, religious leaders? It seems as if, uh, you know, uh, within the black community that uh, uh, religious leaders were... Uh, they, they, were the, they were the main call. They... they they held the community together, and that's, that's been true for years. I remember a lot of ministers we had here. There was Reverend Newsbook and Reverend Cowman, and Reverend Nelson was my favorite because he took an interest in the youth and took his cap and and uh, uh, he had a son of about our age. And, uh, Reverend Liggins was here, and, and uh, believe it or not, I used to go to church regularly. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't anymore Shame for on you. various reasons. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, the South was built around the, the church. I mean, that was their mainstay. That was their that was their strength. And a lot of communities, it still is. Smaller communities. You ever watch T.D. Jakes? Mm-hmm. Man. <laughs> He's Texas, isn't he? Well, he's got to follow it. My goodness. Mm -hmm. Well, what was uh, life like within the black community itself? Was you know in Piqua? Yeah. Like, what do you mean? Well, in terms of uh, you know socialization, for example, what, how did how did you socialize? What what things did you do you know together for fun? Uh, okay. Okay. What places did you frequent? Were there you know? There wasn't any places to frequent in Piqua. <laughs> you weren't permitted. Uh, uh, well, when I first came to town, maybe that was a, a lot later. Uh, there was a place, uh, for example, the Colony Club, and, and uh, I heard about Barney's. Or, oh, that's that's much later. Much later than much, what were much you? later. I understand. When I was a kid, there was a place down on Main Street and Green Street, as Catechet across from where the. Uh, Walmart car place that now that was owned by blacks and there was a pool room there and a whatever. <laughs> but, uh, 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 oh, that's much later. I'm talking about as a student to go to different places, you didn't. They wouldn't accept you. Mm -hmm. uh, I only played football one year because my track coach discouraged me because he was trying to work on a scholarship for me at Miami. When they had the black players that would go to eat after the game, they would go to a place called the Roxy Restaurant, which is where the Atlantis with the big t-shirts. They'd eat in the kitchen. The black players would eat in the kitchen. I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't. Uh, I think I told you before, when I was still a well, it was the ninth grade then, I qualified for the state cross-country meet. 
and the superintendent, and I hope everybody hears me say this, his name is Dietrich, who is just about as big as it as they come, he would not, and I qualified as a ninth grader to go to the state cross country meet, and he wouldn't pay my way. Raymond Moat paid my way out of his pocket, and I went with the Greenville cross country team. And I, and I never ever get Larry. Well, well, why, why did you go with the Greenville cross? That's the only way I had to go. Because nobody qualified from here but me. From Pickwood but me. And so Sauls was, remember Sauls, the starter? He was, uh, I went with the, who I'd been in competition with. I went with their team. And that's when Ra Raymond Moat arranged for me to go with him so I could get there. In Delaware, Ohio. And I was still going to Wilder School. I never forget, I got my first letter, man, I, I grabbed that letter and run down to my mother's work day. She sewed it on my sweater, you know what I mean? I was still going, I'm hot stuff. I'm going to junior high with a varsity P on my sweater, you know what I mean? <laughs> was there any explanation by the uh, superintendent or the athletic director's <laughs> office that, in terms of why they wouldn't because support you? Because I was black. That was the reason. It was just... It was bad news. He was just ter he was terrible. Mm. They, uh, Pickle hasn't always been that liberal. They, uh, <coughs> anyway, we went to this cross country meet with these Greenville guys, and we come back and we went there. We shard together. We ate there after before or after what I remember what. We came back through Urbana. And there was six of us. That's what they had station wagons, you know. And there was six of us, and we stopped in this place. I don't remember, it was downtown Urbana. And went in, and the fella, the, the fella says, uh, uh, Well, I, 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 can't, I can't serve him. Because I was a Negro. I was a black man, I was a Negro. <laughs> so, them guys who were not my teammates, they weren't even in there either. We went down to a little grocery store around the corner and the coach Sauls bought bologna and bread and pop and we sat on the curb and ate. Because I couldn't go in there, they didn't go in there either. And that was at Urbana. It was in Urbana, but it was a Greenville team. Urbana, Ohio, the Greenville team. Yeah. I mean, you know, to say things haven't changed. <laughs> yeah, that's a, I used to work for Dr. Wilkins, I started to tell you. And and on Saturdays, I would drive him. I'd learn to ride. And I'd drive around. And just, that's when doctors went to your, would come to your home. And on Saturdays, I would drive him on his different house calls. And he was a South Carolina man. And the main five-star restaurant in Pickle was down where the hotel is now. That, the, that the Ernst had a, you know, a five-star restaurant. And that's where everybody ate of any, of any importance. We'd go in there and eat. They wouldn't even turn their head when I was in there. And he said, come on, Elmer. We'd go in there and sit down and eat. And the Laura Hamburger shop, remember it? Down that little building right downtown. We, we went in there one time after a track meet, and, and they put our hamburgers in a sack, and we threw it at them. And <laughs> yeah, they threw a little sack of hamburgers at them. But, they, but I'd go in there with him, and they wouldn't say a word. <laughs> I can never understand that. I can never understand that. Well, we're about to, you know, ready to run out of uh, tape here, Elmer. Is there anything that uh, we haven't touched on that uh, y you would uh, like to have some uh, documentation or recording of or uh, have an opportunity to speak to? Well, one thing I can say about Pickle, when I first started in business, the... Homer and Reagan would have a hard time borrowing money to do their jobs. You know, in, 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 in construction work, you, you, it's not like somebody comes in your home and does some remodeling, you give them 50% of the job, and, and then they, they completed, you give them the other 50%. Most of the contract work is construction work. You get the job, you work 30 days, you bill for 90% of the job, and then you wait another 60 days to get paid, so you had to ask somebody to finance the job. In the old regime at the bank, would not loan them any money. Only if Martin Barr would air that wheel or Fred Lang would counterside for them. Well, when I got in business and it changed 
And Elwood Penrod was the president. And then Elwood Penrod was her neighbor. I never had any problems with getting money. I never had to have a credit line. And I'd ask them, but no, what do you need? You know. And, and uh, the only time they got kind of shaky was when, <laughs> when uh, uh, we was working at the uh, truck plant in Dayton. It used to be the Frigidaire plant converted to making its S10 trucks. And the general contractor went bankrupt, and he owed me a whole lot of money. And be uh, uh, foreman, and they were kind of nervous then, but they never really pressured me. And I paid them, but they never pressured me. But then, of course, when you when you started being a number instead of a name, when the different larger banks came here, then it was a different story. You had to have credit line, and you had to have a resume, and you had to have financial statements and all that. But I never did with Elwood. Elwood and Warren Gravel, she treated me as well. Well, Elmer, we're just about out of time. There's less than a minute uh, left on the tape, and uh, I just want to say uh, I, I thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, come and uh, and uh, obtain some, you know, information that I hope will be worthwhile in terms of uh, uh, a record uh, for uh, the community in terms of uh, knowing what uh, life was like uh, for uh, a person of color growing up in Pickle, Ohio. And I appreciate uh, your uh, forthrightness. Well, in let, let me say this. The way Pickle is today speaks for itself. I mean, there's a lot of advances that they've made here. Where you live, and, and where I live, and where some of the people, other, other, other people did, that would have been impossible years ago. But through uh, civil rights acts and perseverance and, and employment and whatnot, it's better. There's always room for improvement. I don't care what you do. But, but I'm proud to live here. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay, well, thanks again. And Did I hit anything that you wanted to hear? I just wanted to give you an opportunity to share. And well, I hear a whole lot of other things. You know, you, how your mind clicks when you talk and things come back to you. And, and, uh, most of the experiences I had here were, were possible. They were bad. Okay. Um, you're not, we're not still recording, are you? Or, but they wouldn't let him buy a house. So they just own pickle.